I'm Liz Faubless, and this is Currents. Cuba may be honoring Good Friday, but is that day the right time to play ball here in the U.S.? Plus, when does Holy Week really end? The good news of the resurrection on Easter Sunday is truly the end of the story because it binds us up with Christ and the hope of eternal life. And depicting the passion in music and art. The goal is to show how the theme of Holy Week, of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, his passion, his death, his crucifixion, have inspired artists over the centuries. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, if you're a baseball fan, listen up. It's the day you've been waiting for, opening day. Now, technically the season already started. Last week, the A's and Mariners played two regular season games in Japan, but the first game of the 2012 season on U.S. soil will be played tomorrow night. The World Series champion Cardinals taking on the Marlins. It's the home opener at the Marlins' brand new ballpark and the only regular season game on the Wednesday schedule. More teams will kick off their seasons over the next two days. Now, while we don't want to dampen the excitement for fans, keep in mind, the start of the season comes during Holy Week, which is supposed to be a solemn time for Christians in the U.S. and around the world. This year, there are nine games on the schedule for Good Friday. Eight of them are home openers. It's a fact that does not sit well with the Catholic League and its president, Bill Donahue. Donahue is saying this week that MLB Commissioner Bud Selig should at least observe what he called the O'Connor Rule. What's that exactly? Well, in 1998, New York's John Cardinal O'Connor said playing on Good Friday at the very least from 12 to 3 is cheap and cheapens our culture no matter how big the box office receipts. According to the Bible, 12 to 3 is the time during Jesus' crucifixion when darkness fell over the land. Well, Donahue took his criticism even further, saying Selig should take a page from the communists. This after Cuban President Raul Castro announced he would honor Pope Benedict's request and make Good Friday a national holiday in Cuba, at least for this year. Well, to talk more about all of this, I spoke earlier today with the Catholic League's communications director, Jeff Field. All right, Jeff, well, we're tying today's topic into a very historic event. For the first time since its revolution 53 years ago, Cuba will celebrate Good Friday as a national holiday. So the question today, does Cuba appreciate Good Friday more than the states? Maybe uh, it, it, it does when it comes to uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, there are a few games that are being played on, uh, on Friday, um, opening day, which is a uh, large event in the baseball season. Some games which are taking place between the hours of noon and 3, uh, you know, which is the hours of Christ's crucifixion. So Major League Baseball, um, which has honored uh, Jewish holidays such as Yom Kippur um, at the request of Congressman Anthony Weiner a few years ago, um, it's, it, it is it is an honoring Good Friday by uh, having baseball games being played during the hours of Christ's crucifixion. So maybe the commissioner of Major League Baseball, Bud Selig, should take a play, uh, page out of the communist playbook here and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know maybe switch around. You know, uh, Cardinal O'Connor uh, had had said that you know it cheapens the um, it cheapens the uh, baseball. It, it cheapens baseball. It cheapens the holiday, even no matter how big the uh, the gate receipts are. Um, to play on Good Friday, and especially during the hours of noon and three. And we're just asking for consideration in the future um, to be taken by Major League Baseball to, to not schedule games on Good Friday or at, at the very least not between noon and three. And Jeff, I just want to put this into some time perspective. Now, depending on when Good Friday falls, it seems that Major League Baseball has always had games on that day. Has this only recently become an issue, or have people been objecting to this from the very beginning? Or how far back would you know? Well, back when Cardinal O'Connor um, was uh, in our, um, was in uh, New York, he had uh, commented on it. So, I mean, obviously, there it, baseball um, hasn't played on Good Friday, and, you know, and, it, and sometimes it just happens during the season. So we understand that, especially on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, that's a big a day for baseball. But this is opening day, and and you know, it's one thing if they wanted to schedule these games um, during the evening hours or at least after three o'clock. Um, that'd be one thing, but to schedule games um, between noon and three, it just, it, I mean, it, it takes away from the sacredness of uh, the Christian holiday. The Cincinnati Reds, um, they switched their opening day from, it was originally scheduled for Good Friday, but they switched it, they asked uh, the commissioner to switch it to um, Holy Thursday, and um, as a, a former resident of Cincinnati, you know, I was very happy to hear that. So with the, um, so with the Cincinnati Reds, they asked 
baseball and baseball uh, conceded. So it isn't out of the question that baseball can switch the schedule around. And, and in, you know, th- this has been, you know, we understand that sometimes it'll happen um, that uh, base, the baseball season will occur during Good Friday. But um, we just ask that if it does happen, don't play the games between noon and three. Jeff, I also want to broaden this out a little bit. Here in the States, Good Friday is a Christian holiday, as you know. It's not a federal holiday, so we have baseball and services such as the post office, mail, banking will not be disrupted. Some stores will be open. Now, the stock market's closed. Should closures for religious observances be left up to the discretion of businesses and private and public government agencies, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, there are, especially when it's, I mean, there are uh, federal holidays such as Christmas and and stuff like that when, where, where most uh, everybody celebrates. Um, you know, Good Friday is, and, and similar to, say, Yom Kippur for the Jew, uh, Jewish holidays, you know, not everybody celebrates it. So it should be left up to the discretion, I, I would say, of certain businesses to respect the, uh, to respect the um, uh, religious preferences of, uh, of, of their employees or, or, or what have you. Um, as far as Good Friday being a federal holiday, you know, we obviously w- we wouldn't be opposed to it becoming a federal holiday or anything like that. Um, but it's, it, it, you know, it is, uh, I think, more or less, it, it probably should be left to the discretion of the uh, individual businesses. All right, Jeff. Well, you've raised the issue. You're obviously very passionate about it with regard to baseball and Good Friday. How far have you gotten in terms of taking these issues to assemblymen, taking them to politicians, taking them to someone that could actually enact the change that you're looking for? Well, yesterday, uh, our president, Bill Donahue, wrote a letter to Bud Seeley, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, just asking him, you know, saying that, it's, you know, we know it, we understand it's too late right now to, to switch these games around on Friday. But we just ask that going forward, he invoke the O'Connor rule uh, and to, to not either not schedule games on Good Friday or at the very least not schedule games between the hours of noon and three. And, you know, going forward, especially this, this weekend being opening day, there are a lot of events, and, and it's a more celebratory time for baseball. So, but between the hours of noon and three, it's not a celebratory time for Christians, and we would just we would just ask for uh, respect that he gave to uh, to the Jewish uh, to people of the Jewish religion um, a couple of years ago when he switched the uh, start of a game from eight o'clock to one o'clock so Jews could uh, observe. All uh, right, Jeff. All right, Jeff. Thank you so much. Fair enough. That's the last word. Thank you very much for joining us. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. And that was Jeff Field of the Catholic League. Now, when we return, we'll get you caught up on all the day's top headlines. So stay tuned. There's more Currents Ahead. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Liz Fawbliss. Coming up later, during Passion Week, reflecting on Christ's suffering through sight and sound. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, it's a headline that is becoming far too familiar. A gunman, a college campus, and several innocent, unsuspecting victims. That is the tragedy unfolding at Oikos University, a vocational Christian school in Oakland, California, where yesterday a former nursing student fatally shot seven people execution style and wounded three others. All this according to the city's police chief. Now, the suspect, identified as one go, was reportedly displeased with the school's administration and may have been upset that classmates mistreated and disrespected him when he attended the school. The police chief also saying he was asked to leave the school several months ago because of behavioral problems. Gao was taken into custody outside a Safeway grocery in Alameda, several miles from the scene of the attack, turned himself into an employee at the store after driving there in a vehicle he had commandeered from one of his victims. The university is affiliated with Praise to God Korean Church. Well, the Catholic aid organization Caritas says rebels in northern Mali destroyed a local Caritas office after staff had evacuated the local office in Gao over the weekend. A church compound was also destroyed. Caritas is still able to operate in the country, providing aid in the form of food despite ongoing conflict. Now, last month, Mali's president was overthrown in a coup. Meanwhile, in France, the killing of innocent people has prompted French authorities to deport suspicious foreign citizens. Two foreign citizens identified as Islamist radicals were removed from the country in keeping with a pledge by President Nicolas Sarkozy to quash Muslim extremism. That decision is in response to a series of killings in the Toulouse region by a man who claimed to be a member of Al-Qaeda. Three other foreign citizens will soon be expelled as well. Last week, the authorities arrested 19 people suspected of ties to Muslim groups calling for violence. 16 remain in custody. 
Well, a former imam in Bangladesh who converted to Catholicism is back home after being severely beaten by members of his community. According to Asian News, the man spent two months in the hospital. He had first converted to the Presbyterian Church while he was away from home. He then met and married a Catholic woman and converted to her faith. Asian News reports that after they returned to Bangladesh, the man was beaten and the couple was shunned by his community. Meanwhile, a bishop in Iran has a message for Christians in the West value your freedom. At a meeting of the charity Aid to the Church in Need, the Chaldean Bishop of Tehran said Western Christians need to make good use of their freedom. The bishop also urging Christians not to become slaves to a culture that seeks to drive God out of people's hearts. And more on the Vatican's role in helping stem the ongoing violence in Syria. Yesterday, Archbishop Michael Fitzgerald, delegate of the Holy See, addressed the League of Arab States. Fitzgerald reiterating an appeal made by Pope Benedict on February 12th, calling for a, quote, end to all violence and bloodshed in that region. Now, the Archbishop saying that since Benedict made the plea two months ago, the increase in violence has become even more alarming. The Archbishop reassuring those in attendance that the Holy See supports their plight and that Pope Benedict continues to pray for those who have lost their lives, the injured, and all those suffering the consequences of an ever more worrying conflict. Speaking on behalf of the Holy See, Archbishop Fitzgerald called for respect for all places of worship and announced financial contributions have been made to assist with much-needed humanitarian aid. Well, the church in Ireland is investigating an incident in which a priest mistakenly showed images of homosexual pornography to a group of parents. The priest claims he has no idea how the image wound up on the flash drive he used during his presentation. According to the Guardian newspaper, a child was also present when the images were shown. Irish Cardinal Sean Brady says police do not believe any crime was committed. From Rome, it's the chance of a lifetime for young Catholics around the world. As we hear from Rome reports, they're getting a unique opportunity for Holy Week. Since 1968, thousands of university students have gathered in Rome to take part in a meeting called UNIV. It's organized by the Italian Institute for University Cooperation, and it's become so popular that now students from over 200 universities come to Rome to experience Holy Week near the Pope. This time, the theme is Pulcrum, the power of beauty. The truth is that beauty is an integral part of human beings. It allows people to fully develop their thinking and talent. In essence, it's what makes humans human. The conference includes exhibits, concerts, workshops, and also several speakers like Ennio Morricone, who composed the soundtrack for the film The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Also speaking is Estudo Soto, one of the sculptors of Barcelona's Holy Family, and Dr. Scott Hahn, writer and theologian who authored Rome, Sweet Home. These guests are very well prepared. They're very good at what they do. But we shouldn't forget others who will be at the conference, from the attendees to those who will present exhibits. It's a conference that will touch on the importance of many subjects. In fact, some of the participants will attend the Pope's weekly general audience. This year, the group is hoping to give the Pope a card to thank him for his recent trip to Latin America. The conference is a way for youths from different countries and cultures to interact and celebrate Easter in Rome. And the church in Italy is taking some extra steps following a rash of church desecrations. The website Vatican Insider reports the Holy See is allowing Italian churches to lock up the Eucharist to prevent it from being stolen. This comes following a number of incidents in which thieves broke into sacristies and took consecrated hosts. The Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue saying there is a need to educate young people to respect and understand the religious beliefs and practices of others. Well, what better way to start than by shining a light on the feast of Visat Hanamatsuri, which is the most important day in the Buddhist calendar worldwide. The feast celebrates the birth, enlightenment, and passing away of Buddha. It's also the topic of a message by the council entitled Christians and Buddhists sharing responsibility for educating the younger generation on justice and peace through interreligious dialogue. Now why this feast? Because it is associated with the Buddha's universal message of peace and living lives of compassion and generosity. The council's message explains that young people are an asset to all societies and today more and more in classrooms all over the world, students belonging to various religions and beliefs sit side by side learning with one another and from one another. Well, how would you like it if your church offered to fill your gas tank? 
I know I love it, and I'm sure the first 250 cars that showed up at a Wichita, Kansas filling station loved it too. According to the Wichita Eagle, last week the Kingdom Harvest Church, along with radio station power 93.9, donated a total of $5,000 worth of gas, about $20 per car, to hundreds of lucky people. The church's senior pastor says they get so many calls for help and figured a tank of gas was something relevant and could touch and impact everybody. While well, fallout for the legionaries of Christ, the Catholic congregation is selling its property in Thornwood, New York. In a letter, the legionaries' North American director says the congregation decided to sell because of the difficult economy and the scandal surrounding the group's founder. In 2010, the Vatican placed the legion under review following revelations that its founder, Father Marciel Maciel, fathered at least three children and sexually abused seminarians. And the Society of Mary has announced it is leaving the St. John's residence for boys in Rockaway Park, Queens. The society known as the Marianists had administered at the home since 1937. In a statement, they say the decision to leave comes mainly because of aging and diminished personnel. The residence began as an orphan asylum in 1826 and now serves at-risk boys and families. It will remain open, but will be run by a lay staff. Stay tuned. There's more Currents Ahead. Coming up, a positively Catholic talk about the true meaning of Holy Week. We have received the greatest of gifts. The Son of God ceased to distance himself, as many other gods might be in the, in the uh, mythology, and became one of us. Welcome back. Well, almost to the halfway point of Holy Week, arguably the most important time of year for Christians around the world. In the next few days, churches will become more packed. On Thursday, Catholics and other Christians will come together to celebrate the Last Supper, less than a day before the solemn Good Friday liturgy. Which begs an important question. Does Good Friday signal the end of Holy Week the same way it does the work week? Not by a long shot. It's a much different story when it comes to the Week of the Passion. I caused the death of Christ by my sinfulness. The series is called Devoutly Catholic. We're very happy to have a Father Brian McQueenie. Father McQueenie tends to be provocative about the subject matter, you know, to get people to think about new areas of their faith and how to apply it to their daily lives. How empty our lives would be without Christ if Friday was the end of the week. We've lost all hope. This evening, I, I hope to speak to the people on the title, uh, The Week Does Not End on Friday. What I mean by that is a reflection on the nature of Holy Week, that in our present culture, looking at religious life and religious belief, they often think that the end of religion is death, that their lives end with a hopelessness. And for us as Catholics, we realize that though all seemed lost on Good Friday, the good news of the resurrection on Easter Sunday is truly the end of the story because it binds us up with Christ and the hope of eternal life. We look upon this wonderful time and we say wonderful because in the words of the church, Felix Kupa, the happy fault of Adam, we look upon this as a week in which we can come to grips with many of the realities that we deal with every day in our Christian lives, in our humanity. Good Friday comes from the expression, uh, the ancient expression, Felix Kupa, meaning O oh, happy fault of Adam. Because of Adam's sin, we have received the greatest of gifts. The Son of God ceased to distance himself, as many other gods might be in the, in the uh, mythology, and became one of us, took our humanity upon himself, that we might, as the ancient fathers said, that we might become uh, like him. You know, as a seasonal land, um, you usually think of something to give up, but I thought, you know, I'll do something extra, and, and I thought coming here would be a good opportunity. 
I came tonight because I moved to New York a few months ago. I wanted to become more involved in my church, and this seemed like a good thing to go to. And with it being Lent, it seemed like a good time of year to learn a little bit more about the church. I would hope most of all that they will continue uh, looking at uh, sources. I gave them some recommendations as to council documents, uh, histories of the church and things like that, that they would continue their understanding of the faith because it truly is a true, beautiful, and good faith. And stay tuned, there's more Currents Ahead. Just ahead, sounds and visions of the Passion of Christ. Everyone can identify with his crucifixion, his sadness, his suffering, his betrayal, the loss that he had. No matter who you are, everybody on this planet goes through similar types of experiences. The Passion of Christ, it is synonymous with this time of year when we recount Christ's suffering twice in one week at Palm Sunday Mass and the Good Friday Liturgy. But it's also something that's been portrayed in popular media. There's the basic, like the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, which is back on Broadway. There's also the grandiose, like Mel Gibson's 2004 blockbuster, The Passion of the Christ. Now close to home, St. Francis Xavier Parish in Park Slope, took the occasion of a major anniversary to examine the passion in music and art. It's going to be an evening of uh, representations of the Passion of Christ both in artwork and music. In the past, we've done this on several topics, the uh, Virgin Mary, Communion, St. Paul, and as part of the 125th anniversary celebration, we wanted to have one of these evenings again, and uh, it just seemed that this would be a good topic to do, especially during Lent. And what we see here is the Renaissance master taken with the beauty and the glory of the human body, incapable of showing a body whipped and wounded and suffering. And so he invests all the suffering psychologically in the face of Jesus. Our goal is to show how the theme of Holy Week, of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, his passion, his death, his crucifixion, have inspired artists over the centuries to compose great sculptures, great works of uh, painting, as well as music. Even if you're a non-believer, even if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, everyone can identify with his crucifixion, his sadness, his suffering, his betrayal, the loss that he had. No matter who you are, everybody on this planet goes through similar types of experiences. What going beyond the spoken word, what an image, a sculpture, a piece of music enables us to enter into the experience and live it in the way that the words of a lecture don't. Uh, it addresses the sight, the ears, uh, the emotions, and the heart. And so it's a way of living the experience more, which is exactly what these composers and painters did. They sort of entered into it in some way and created their own vision. It's our belief that when we experience great art and music, we begin to live the experience which the artist is able to share with us in a, a way that words or a lecture doesn't always succeed in doing. The presentation was just amazing. This is the third time I've seen Dr. Green present and the choir is spectacular. For me, the most moving part was the religious aspect of the whole thing. I mean, the artwork and the music just flowed so beautifully together. It really was extraordinary. Pope Benedict, particularly if one uh, reads his writings, has spoken about the fact that it's through art that many will come to Christ. And he had that famous meeting where he invited about 75 outstanding artists in all the different fields to meet with him, to ask that this kind of collaboration continue between the arts and the church, and that it be renewed.
And that is all for this edition of Currents. Be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also follow us on Twitter and connect with us on Facebook. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Thank you for watching and have a good night.